Welcome everybody to our very first property coffee morning uh, and it's a lockdown special. I hope you've got your coffee uh, by your side. I've certainly got mine. It's a uh, skinny soy latte, which I'm enjoying in what I can proudly say is the only coffee shop to be open uh, during this lockdown 2.0. Uh, and it's a special property coffee shop uh, because it's not an ordinary coffee shop because here the chat is all about property. I'm joined today by two fabulous guests who I'll introduce you to in a little while. I've got um, Matt Sedell, who's an all-around uh, sort of property expert and founder of the Candor uh, Club group. I've also got a mortgage financing expert, Akil Mayer. And we're going to talk a little bit about the property market, what's happening right now, the effects of lockdown, the effects of coronavirus, this mini boom that we're happening, is it going to last? And more importantly, what's happening next year and uh, what it means for you guys in your property investing game. Now, it's going to be interactive as well. So keep your questions coming. Uh, tell us where you're sort of enjoying your virtual coffee from in the chat uh, window to the side. Uh, tell us where you're dialing, not dialing in for, who says that these days, connecting to us uh, from. Um, and if you've got any questions that you'd like us to cover in this uh, coffee morning, let us know too. So we'll be going on for about, it's about a 50 minute show. The aim is to do this every Tuesday. Um, we'll always have a couple of guests and talk about current topics. And it's more about current topics, but what it means for you guys as property investors and how it will change your property game. Now, um, can I see the chat? How do I see the chat on this thing? Normally, I see it on my phone thing here. Oh, really? oh wow, I can see the chat. Wow, got got a lot of chat going on. That's absolutely wonderful. Um, uh, Hamid is saying he's not having coffee, he's having English breakfast tea. Well, you know, you, that's, that, that, that's great. That's great. Um, we've got um, morning, everyone. Two sugars for me. That's great. Good morning, all. Uh, people from all over the place, espresso, <laughs> a lot of people uh, getting into the coffee vibe. Um, as you can see, it's pretty empty uh, in here. Most of you guys are online um, in our virtual uh, coffee uh, shop. Uh, great. Okay. So, yeah, Homes Under the Hammer is on telly, but what would you do watching that? You know, what's this instead, folks? It's far more uh, useful than uh, Homes Under the Hammer. Craig Shepherd. Um, joining us from local St Albans, which is where we are uh, broadcasting from uh, today. Uh, first question come in from Sanjay uh, for um, Akhil on mortgaging flats. We'll get to that uh, a little bit later on in the show. Okay, let me first introduce you to our two fabulous guests. First of all, Matt. Hi, Matt. How are you doing this morning? Very good, Ranjan. I've got my Grande Lati Almond Mini Mega Milky Choco Mocha. It's actually oh. not, it's, it's <laughs> organic coffee. Someone in my house has bought organic coffee. I don't recommend it. I'm going to come around yours and get a proper coffee as soon as I can. That's good. And uh, just so that people know, you know, when you're in Starbucks, what's your Starbucks name? The name that they scroll on the mug? Rebecca. Rebecca Luz. You, you, you older coffee. News, news expert. <laughs> Rebecca. All oh, right. Okay. I'll just go with Matt. What do you put on your coffee cup? I actually put Ron. Rod. Ron. Ron. My name is meant to be pronounced, although it's spelled to Ron Jan, it's meant to be pronounced Ron John. So I just abbreviate it as Ron for Starbucks. Sounds like uh, <laughs> sounds like the name of a porn star. <laughs> well, without much further ado, tell, tell the public who you are and uh, and why you're on Property Coffee Morning, Matt. So I, I, I'm, I was investing in property since 2000. I bought a flat with my brother in 2000. It wasn't a particular roaring success. I bought I bought flats in the credit crunch in 2009. Those did really well because it's right at the bottom of the market. I built up an HMO portfolio in Reading and then they decided to extend Crossrail um, and Reading shot up 35% in the space of a couple of years. I've done some deals in London. I tried to use a referendum as a buying opportunity in 2016. That was a bit of a disaster. And I'm gonna have some comments about making short-term bets um, when we have our conversation. Um, but three years ago, I started a club called Candle, which is for investors and developers doing deals above a million pounds. Um, we have lots of members in the club doing lots of deals all over the country and some overseas. Um, so I've got a good sense of what's working right now and what's not working right now. And I'm also the founder of a training platform called Tropolis, um, which is a very uh, broad set of training for people who want to 
scaled their property investing um, uh, activities. Most people have already done a deal or two. Some people haven't done any deals, but most people have done a deal or two and they want to get really serious about it. Okay, brilliant. And uh, we're going to hear from you later on in the show. Um, when we sort of discuss some topics in the news and uh, what we all think about them. Um, Akil, now we've done some videos together, we've done some videos with Matt as well. Akil, uh, you're a bit of a mortgage financing uh, expert. Uh, tell people a little bit about your background. Um, well, thank you, Brandon, for having us in your lovely coffee shop this morning. You didn't pay for this, but yeah, but thank you very much. Yes, yes, yes. My round, yes. Yeah, your round next. <laughs> all of you guys at home. <laughs> well, listen, it's always a pleasure to have you uh, be on your on your show. It's always insightful. And likewise with Matt on the call as well now. So hopefully we can get all get a lot of um, information out from there. So for your audience that don't know me, uh, I'm a specialist mortgage broker. We specialize in all types of mortgages. So whether you're a first time buyer, you're a portfolio landlord, or you're a commercial a commercial investor as well. So we, we like to think that we are um, the specialist in the market and we are your go to one stop shop for mortgages and property finance. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, and we'll get on with you know what's happening in the mortgage market. We've got about 114 people joining us live um, for this. So it's been a uh, tremendous week for news, really. Um, we have one of the most prolific um, real estate uh, investors uh, and property owners in the world um, now not leaving at the end of his tenancy and uh, looking to squat in his um, rental property, which is which is which is which is rather a shocking example for um, uh, property uh, investors and landlords and things to do. Of course, I'm talking about none other than uh, Donald Trump. Uh, that has dominated the headlines uh, this week. Now, do you know actually why Donald Trump um, um, can't remain in the White House past January? Because he hasn't got a job. No, no, no. <laughs> because it's for Biden, for Biden. Oh, very good, Brenda. <laughs> very, very good, Ron John. No one can accuse me of making an old joke. I mean, that's brand new, folks. Anyway, uh, uh, Matt, you've been delving through the newspapers, um, and um, basically, I've asked you to pick some uh, stuff out that has caught your eye about the property market for us to have a little chat about. What's what's caught your eye? Well, you, you put me on the spot a little bit. You phoned me up yesterday morning and said, do you want to come to my coffee shop for a chit chat? What's news in the property market? And I said, well, the biggest story of the weekend was that officially, according to Halifax, the average UK house price is now £250,000. In fact, they, according to Halifax, it's £250,457. Right? Um, Go on. So I've been looking around in the papers and yes, according to Halifax, who are obviously a lender, house prices have broken that £250,000 mark. And what I want to discuss with you is, are we experiencing a mini boom? Is this going to be followed by a correction or even a crash? Um, is that going to be correlated to unemployment? Um, or will the fact that interest rates have never been this low, and I, I've got graphs that I could show you as well, will the fact that interest rates have never been this low shore up the market? And also, the, the, the most important question to any investor is, where are the opportunities? Where are the opportunities now and in 2021? So the yeah the headline is basically average house prices in the UK have hit 250,000, 250,457 uh, pounds according to Halifax. Um, this is up seven and a half percent from this time last year. It's obviously part of what they're calling the race for space, as everybody's trying to find gardens and studies so they can work from home without um, too much stress. Um, the growth is no longer accelerating. The growth is slowing. Uh, for instance, the house price growth from September to October was only 0.3%. And that was the weakest month since Rishi, uh, Rishi Sunak announced the stamp duty holiday. And the stamp duty holiday and the drop in interest rates to just 0.1% is obviously um, what's shoring up demand. But there are headwinds. Um, we have got some headwinds. For instance, they're expecting five and a half million jobs to be furloughed in November. Obviously, the furlough scheme is due to end at the end of October, but it's been extended. So they're anticipating there'll be, according to the Bank of England, another five and a half million jobs will be furloughed this month. That's up from two million in October. So that's quite a large increase. There's a lot of jobs being furloughed uh, this month or anticipated being furloughed. This is quite significant, really, isn't it? Because, I mean, for years, it's been the average UK house price. It's just a measure like the FTSE 100 and the S&P 500. It's a measure uh, of average. That's all it is. Well, um, it's, it's, it's probably the Halifax trying to grab the headlines because 
Uh, they've beaten nationwide to come up with this £250,000 mark. And if you look at the land registry house price index, the latest data from the land registry, uh, which includes all the um, cash purchases, of which there are quite a large number, uh, according to the land registry, house price, average house prices still at £240,000 at the end of August. Mm -hmm. But you're right. Go on, Ranjan. I sort of jumped in there. No, no, it's absolutely fine. I, I think I, this is quite a landmark because it was pretty much around £200,000 for several years, it seems. Uh, this is quite a landmark figure. Uh, you mentioned it slowing down, um, but don't you think that's a lot of, a lot of sort of um, seasonal slowing down? Because it all is, it slows down as we get into Christmas again, and then you have the spring um, bounce. Yeah, I was thinking this before we jumped on the call that you know, these fluctuations in house prices, they only really affect the Southeast and they only really, really affect London and they only really, really affect detached houses because detached houses they're more expensive than flats or terraced houses and what have you. But the volatility in house prices is always at the more um, expensive end of the market. The more affordable end of the market is perhaps a bit seasonal, but prices aren't so volatile and they don't tend to swing up and down quite so aggressively. Uh, so I think you are absolutely right. Some of this is seasonal. The auctions cooled a little bit last month, according to uh, Piotr and Jay, who I was speaking to at the weekend. Uh, that was quite interesting that the, the auction room cooled a little bit. But yeah, some of it's seasonal. There's quite a few important things happening in March as well, uh, because, go on. Before we get you on to that, I just want to bring Akil in. Um, how do you see, I mean, th this £250,000 milestone, um, what are you seeing in terms of um, mortgage valuations and um, the the, the the surveyor's attitude to kind of um you know when they value property are they actually supporting the sort of this sort of movement this mini boom yeah so before we jumped on the line we talked about how, how busy we are in the in the market at the moment now compared to uh q3 in 2019 and 2020 we can definitely definitely categorically say that we've got double the amount of pipeline this time than compared to last year so pipeline has never been grander and I think, as Matt did touch on, we've got some fundamental um, milestones at the moment. We've got stamp duty benefit. We've got help to buy benefit. We've got these huge, huge benefits where people are taking advantage of it. So I think that's why we're busy. Going back to your valuation question, I think um, valuers, to be honest with you, 90% of the time are coming on point, whether it's a remortgage or a purchase. Now, the only times they're coming a bit under value is a more specialist market. So if that's a, a mixed-use property, if it's a, a full-blown HMO, those sort of properties are a bit more sketchy because a lot of clients are looking for a, a commercial or a yield valuation, uh, whereas valuers will use uh, the lower of the, the bricks and mortar valuation as a safeguard and a safe measure for their own PEI, if you like, as well. So um, it's space, especially around the commercial side, but a lot of the valuers, as I said, about 95% of them are coming in on point. So um, it's, all, it's, all, um, it's all good news from the valuers' perspective, in my eyes. Okay. And you mentioned... Um... Um, a slowdown. Do, do you see that? No. I mean, a lot of people are talking about it. I mean, this is for both of you, really. A lot of people are talking about this um, crash that's expected in 2021. I mean, how, how do you see that? To be honest with you, so it's been a huge pent up demand. So before COVID turned up, we had that big Boris bounce in January and February once, you know, Brexit was signed off. We had COVID, COVID slowed it down in spring, but as soon as we came out of lockdown, sort of May, June, July, August, it's been huge pent up demand, lots of applications. Lenders have, have got their docs lined up in terms of how to process application, who's doing what, where they're working from. So from the lender's perspective, they're doing amazing and I can't fault them because they've, they've, they're introducing more and more products into the market. The loan to values are now being increased. And in spring, they were sort of between 60, 65, 70. And in where we are now in November, we're at, we're at the heights. We've got lenders out there doing 90% loan to value. And, Sorry, loan to values are increasing. That's for investor mortgages. Yeah, they're both sides. So whether you're a first time buyer, we've got 90% out there, albeit that the lenders come in and out for a couple of days. But the, the, the attitude and the appetite is there, especially for the first time buyers. And again, with, with the buy to let market, we've got lenders like Paragon, who, who are massive in the student let market. They exodus um, in, Q, uh, in Q2, but they're back in the market. So the appetite is, is growing. There's a lot more, there's products coming on the market. And as I said, the, the loan to values, whether you're an investor or an owner occupier, especially in the residential side, the appetite is very much, um, it's very much bright. This is very interesting because always in, in anything, you should follow the money. And um, when lenders are increasing their appetite to, to lend, 
they're increasing their loan to values um, and some lenders that exited because many lenders did or not many some lenders exited in the first lockdown and then they just just came back in and um, Matt what do, what do you feel on a sort of slowdown or crash going into 2021? I'm hearing a lot of concern from some people about unemployment and uh, that being a driver to put downward pressure on house prices because previously um, we've had a couple of periods where unemployment's gone quite high. In 1993, unemployment hit 10.5% and prices dropped 20%. In 2008, the banking crisis forced unemployment up to 8% and again, prices dropped by 20%. But if you look at the graph for interest rates, they've never They've, I don't think they've ever been below 2%. We're down at 0.1% now. So that's a very different um, backdrop. Uh, we, we, we are going to see more unemployment. That's a given. Everybody ex expects uh, unemployment to rise from, I think it's 4.5% at the moment. And it could go up to as much as 8%, maybe some predicting just below 8%. And, and you would anticipate a drop in, in house prices accordingly. Yeah, um, yeah. At the moment, at the moment, you can't evict your tenants and you can't repossess the, the property. And I think you've got the same thing in commercial property until the end of the year. So, so those are factors to consider. But interest rates are so low. I was on the phone to someone yesterday and she's got a £20,000 mortgage on a £300,000 property. I said, why don't you look at gearing up that property at 50%? And the rate's one and a half percent. It's so cheap. And, yeah. and release 150 grand and go and buy an income producing property. Even for investment mortgages, it is. I mean, uh, this is the typical type of question from Goss um, Campus, uh, who's asking buy now, take advantage of low interest rates and risk a crash or defer in anticipation of a crash. <laughs> <laughs> Will there be a crash or won't there be a crash? What, 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 what do you think, Matt? I think you need to go on the Landridge House Price Index and have a play around. It's a really good tool. You can set the start date and the end date. You can set the borough. You can set whichever part of the country you want to look at and just have a look for how much prices fluctuate because um, prices inside the M25, they are a little bit volatile, especially at the expensive end of the market. But prices elsewhere, if you're buying and holding, you know, over a 10 year period, you're going to see some really good appreciation. Absolutely. And who knows? The other thing about the unemployment is that it's, it's, it's not the unemployment is not evenly spread across the whole of the labor market. It is um, what I'm hearing um, being experienced more by the younger members of the labor market. There's more unemployment uh, amongst younger younger people than there is against not enough seventy people. Old going up chimneys. You mean? <laughs> I don't think those times are behind us now. But uh, apparently, there's, there are more young unemployed than there are um, uh, more older um, members of the labor market. So, so that affects things. You know, there was a, um, a, a new story just this morning, actually. James Reed, the founder of the Reed Recruitment Company, uh, they've put out a survey um, and they've found that the um, job vacancy advertisements have increased um, in the last couple of weeks. Um, so, it, and, and obviously we've just got this vaccine announcement and, um, and all of that. This is likely to be the last lockdown that we've had. The stock markets have gone through the roof. They're expecting all of this to uh, be at an end. So once the employment market comes back, there's been one trillion pounds worth of money pumped into the economy through all the quantitative easing that we've had, which is 30 grand per household, apparently. And the thing is that where does this money go? it has to go into inflating asset prices. Mm. So I'm not convinced. I, I don't, I'm not convinced that all of this mini boom that we have had is due to just a stamp duty holiday. I think part of it is all the money that's been pumped into the economy, one trillion pounds worth, three times more than at the credit crunch. So I think as soon as this employment thing sorts itself out, we're gonna see that money, that all that money that's been pumped in it has to go somewhere uh, and the usual home for it is in inflating assets so, so I, I don't think there'll be a crash i mean what do you think of that i certainly agree with you Ranjan. i think I, I can't see a crash happening especially in the resi market um i think a lot of our clients were gearing up in 2019 with the anticipation that we're going to have a correction in 2020 and albeit that's been now been delayed for probably another 12 months or so so i think this time next summer i think we might have a small correction but we can't see a 200 pound property going down to 100,000. I just can't see it because we've got a lack of housing, right? We've got a lack of housing, we've got a growing population, aging population. 
I think, as you said, you know, Stan Drew does play a bit, bit of a part and help to buy does. But if you look at the trends um, over the last few years, property prices have been growing, growing, growing. And from a trends perspective, I know Matt did talk about trends, a lot of our clients are actually now buying in commuter zones outside London, you know, because they're, they're anticipating more working from home or working from local remote serviced offices in particular. So they're finding investor property, investment properties in, in um, small, smaller towns where there's good commuters, good commuter travel into London. Um, and that's where I saw, I saw an article this morning actually around London rent prices have come down, but yeah, they have. London property prices have rents have actually gone up. So, and we're seeing that in our, in our market as well, because obviously we do buy to let mortgages as well. So we've seen a lot of clients looking outside London and you get more for your buck as well, that way as well. And the rents are growing, it's more of a safer asset. And, and it's good, it's not that I always, always tell my clients, look for good schools, look for good train links, Look for prosperity within, within, if they're looking to regenerate the town, look for those areas because yes, it's always been a long game, right? You've got to look at the long game. As long as it's washing its own face, I say today, look for the long game. And ultimately, if you bought something in year 2000, it's still, it's, you know, it's got at least doubled by now in value in 20 years. And where else can you make that return? Akhil, I've got a question from you. Um, I've had a few like this. This is from Jason K. actually. Um, and yeah, lenders are coming on the market, they're, they're increasing the LTVs and all of that, but they're getting really picky. Um, it seems these days that, um, you know, your, your bank state statements are subject to the equivalent of a rubber glove inspection at Heathrow uh, Airport uh, Customs team. So uh, what's, what's going on with that? And is that sort of rubber glove examination going to continue? <laughs> well, listen, I hope not. And, and I tell my clients, a lot of clients come to me for the first time, well, we've never used a broker, we've always gone direct. And I say, well, you've obviously, something's obviously gone wrong and your mindset's changed, hence why you picked up the phone or emailed or called me. So I always say to my clients, use a broker. This is the best time to use a mortgage broker. Make sure they're independent, make sure, make sure they've got access to the whole market because we've got our finger on the pulse. We know what the flavor of the month is. We know what to post to the lenders and we know what they look for. So, yeah, but Akil, where on earth can I find such a mortgage broker? I mean... <laughs> zero two, zero three, that's a plug. <laughs> you put your details in the context. Of yeah, the that's a plug. But no, no, listen, I always say to our clients, use us. We work for our clients. We don't work for the lender. We'll examine your bank statements. We know what lenders like, what they don't like. So if, if for example, someone's got uh, different types of streams of income, we'll go to clients that accept that. If someone's got a bit of a gambling habit in the background and you can see that quite clearly on the bank statement, we won't go to those lenders. So it's all about working smart, right? And, and the average Joe will only know the high street banks, whereas we probably know 100 banks. And, and that's what we do for a day job, right? So that's our job. Our client's job is to do what they do best in their, in their, in their, in their day job. Are there any that are happy with their William Hill habit? <laughs> I tell you what, there is. I, there's usually a home for everyone. <laughs> it's a thing that they're subject to. <laughs> Matt, well, what, what's, what, what other articles have you uh, found that perked your interest? Um, you it was really to? just around house prices and whether I, I, was, I was studying the, the correlation between unemployment and house prices because as much as anybody, you know, I want to know, are we going to see a big correction? And Which one do you want me to pull up on the screen? The Times or the... Yeah, the Times is a good one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, but the, there was a couple of points just raised just then about uh, yeah. taking a long term view. And I think that really is important at the moment. It reminds me um, of that time in, at the end of 2008. My mortgage broker phoned me up and he said, Matt, do you want to buy um, a flat in, 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 uh, in Twickenham? It was. He said, Bellway have got 12 flats. They can't sell. They finished this development. No one's buying. And I phoned up all my friends in property and I phoned up all my friends in the city. They're all getting sacked by Lehman Brothers, which was going under. And they said, don't buy any property. You're going to lose all your money. And I went back to my friend who's the mortgage broker, who's a guy I went to school with. I said, if you're buying one, I'll buy one. And everyone said I was mad. And in fact, so many people said I was mad that I went back and I bought a second one from Barrett in Wandsworth. And because I was buying on a long-term basis, I, I, I took a long-term view on it and I, it was okay. Yeah. I refinanced my flat in Battersea that I was living in. I pulled out a hundred grand. I put it down on those two flats. And two years later, um, they, they, they'd gone up by like, there was 200 grand of capital appreciation sitting there. And it's how I ended up buying this place. Um, so I don't think it's a good time to be. You mean that's short. not a green screen? No, this is my actual gaff range. I mean, that's a <laughs> genuine marble fireplace, buddy. Um, I got it off the back of a lorry. No, I didn't really. Uh, but I don't think it's a good time to be taking any short-term bets. 
It's, you know, this is a long-term investor's market. Buy something that you can improve, extend, add value to. And remember, look for those three things. If you really want to find a good deal, you need the right property that you can add some value to. You need the right vendor that wants the cash more than they want the bricks and mortar. And you need the right circumstances, because if you're bidding against some numpty, you're not going to get a good price out of the vendor. And those three things essentially protect you from any short-term downside. You do it from the long term, but to protect against short-term immediate downside, stick with those three things and you're, you're home and dry. Yeah, every um, time. So, yeah, go on. You, you picked out a couple of other articles. Was, it, was there anything in specific you wanted to kind of... Um, um, I'll tell you where I ended up. I ended up go looking on. at the ev evictions because if you can't evict anyone, there's not going to be any repossessions. And I had a quick drink on Wednesday night with a friend of mine. Uh, it was a business meeting uh, just before we went into the lockdown. And, you know, this guy does, he does corporate recovery. And I thought, Elliot's going to be really busy at the moment. I said, you must be rushed off your feet. It must be deals left, right and centre. You bet you can't choose which ones to go after. He said, there's nothing happening. The government's given everyone cash. No one's going out of business. You can't evict any tenants, whether it's commercial or residential. Um, and when that changes, I, you know, I, I want to see what the impact on the market. And that's one, something I wanted to talk with you about, Ranjan, because at the moment you've got eviction bans on resi and commercial. Mm -hmm. um, the commercial eviction bans coming to an end at the end of the year. Is that right? That's what they said. The resi, there's going to be a truce over Christmas, so you can't ruin anyone's Christmas. You just mm. have to ruin their new year. Mm. Um, you know, is but that no, going to have an impact? New year onto a fresh start. That's the other way of looking at yeah, it. Kick them out on the street. Disaster. Um, but, you know, is that having an effect? People aren't paying their mortgages for six months because they've got a six month mortgage holiday. Uh, when that changes, is that going to is that going to have an impact on the market? What are your thoughts, Ranjan? Um, I think the uh, it, it, it's actually I, I think the property market has held up pretty well. It's the people that had problem properties um, that have faced a lot of problems, quite frankly. In the, let's start with the commercial, for example. The commercial uh, market has been, the landlords have been most affected are the ones which were, had, t had tenants in them in, in old world economy type of um, shops. In other words, stores selling products off the shelves you can buy from Amazon. Um, the service sector has been affected by lockdown, but fundamentally is good and solid for the long term. Uh, what I have found is that some of the larger tenants haven't paid rent uh, because they can, um, but they, they, their books are doing quite well. Uh, so what we expect is as soon as um, the rules change, those few people that are doing that will uh, basically sort of pay up. Um, the, the residential market, rental market, has been most affected, I feel, in London because um, there are so few, uh, uh, central London is a bit of a ghost town if it come, when it comes to jobs, the hospitality, restaurant sector, entertainment sector, offices, it's been decimated. No one wants to commute by the tube. So when you're doing rental property, HMOs, studio flats, that kind of thing in outer London where people used to commute from, um, people, uh, there is far less demand. You know, people from Europe are staying put, people are going back to you know, wherever their parents were or uh, family homes and that kind of stuff. Um, and that has affected um, rents and rents in London have fallen probably more so than other parts of the country. Um, but London is London. And when you go into a hotel anywhere in the world, you see uh, above the reception desk, you see London, New York, Tokyo, all those clocks on the wall. Um, they don't, you don't have a clock yet for Birmingham <laughs> in any hotel outside of Birmingham. Um, London's an international city and London will always be London and people want to be there. I, I, think, I, I think you're right, Ranjan. Just got to hold it for the short term. It's not good for yields though, is it? If rents are dropping and prices aren't falling that much. Yields, yields but then are, what do you expect yields to do when interest rates are at 0 0.1? Yields are an interesting problem. Um, and this is going to balance itself out sooner or later. There is no business case today for anyone new into buy to let to buy buy to let property in London. It doesn't make sense from a yield basis. Um, the, the, the issue though is if you are holding on to stock that you've held for some time, um, is it really worth you holding on to it? Are you better off um, disposing of some of that stock and doing something else uh, with, the, with the proceeds? And that is already what's happening. Um, 
we're looking at disposing a few stuff in London ourselves. I'm sure other people are too. That will, in, in this very short space of time, have an effect on the amount of properties that are available. Um, and then it starts to correct itself. But I, it never, it, the yields in London will always be low because it's, you, you invest in London for capital appreciation. Yeah. You, you made a very good point there, Ranjan, about reconfiguring your equity and restructuring. I, I had a great call with someone yesterday. She, she jumped on the phone and she was, you know, she's not quite got enough income. And by the time I got to the end of it, I was like, you've got all this equity in your own home. You're trying to pay down your mortgage, but you can borrow 150 grand at one and a half percent. If you redeploy that somewhere, you can get 20 percent return on investment. You're going to have a 30 grand bump on your income. Um, you've also got a couple of buy to lets that are in your own name. By the time you've reconfigured your equity, that's just sitting there in your own home not doing very much you're going to be a higher rate taxpayer so why don't you sell those two buy to lets as well because hopefully from now on you'll always be a higher rate taxpayer and and just get rid of those two buy to lets because the return on the investment them is, is rubbish just and just get yourself organized but let's assume that somewhere in the next year or two we're going to be at the bottom of the tick where do you want to be in 10 years time and start aiming for that you know when you hit 2030 what do you want it to look like do you want to be doing rent to rent where you're basically a slave for nothing or do you want to actually own some property that's going to have gone up where your equity's doubled and then doubled again? I actually think, I mean, you raise an interesting topic. I actually think, I mean, people have been talking about a circuit break. Um, that's been one of these um, uh, government and think tank type of uh, buzzwords now. And I, I actually think it's a time for property investors to have a, take a circuit break in some property investment strategies, which really are not the best for going forward. And I would say to people that rent to rent, you know, things like rent to service accommodation, um, deal sourcing and deal packaging might not be a great thing to focus a ton of effort on when now the opportunity is to acquire great pieces of real estate um, from motivated sellers, um, get the funding yourself because it's really not that complicated if you've got clean credit, add some value and then get it cash flowing and simply hold it. If you miss that opportunity, you miss that yeah. opportunity you're dealing with rent to rent. Yeah, and do you know what, Ranjan? That's what you've done well. You've bought and hold, let the capital gains deliver you lots of, uh, of, of equity. And um, it allows me to sit in this long long game. shop. Uh, well, to... if I'm honest, Ranjan, it looks half empty. Are you, are you even <laughs> making any money there? No, we've cleared it. We've cleared it so that um, you're, not, you're not paying any business rates at the moment, anyway. So 164 people in it at the moment, so uh, <laughs> they'll be part of the camp. <laughs> Go on, stuff. I was, I was going to add to that. What I would say is that I still think it's still a great opportunity buying property at the moment. It's obviously you've got to look for the long hold at the moment, but you know, Ranjan, you always talk about look at where you can add value properties through PD, through conversion, splitting titles, and so on. So I think it's still a very optimistic market. I think. We, everyone's, you know, we, we have to be a realist, but we need to be an optimistic as well. So we've got, we've got great tools to have. We've got great lenders willing to lend. We haven't got a liquidity issue. We've got plenty of stock out there in the market that we can do and change property to. So it's just putting your hat on, putting your brain hat on, using the right tools, speaking to a planning consultant, speaking to our peers and see how we can add value to properties. And, and I think if you're going to sell off property, especially in your portfolio, you've got to be conscious of capital gains tax, you know? You've got, you're going to open up a whole different can of worms where if you can look at repurposing those properties, if you've got an old Victorian and it's yielding 3% in London, well, look at splitting it, you know, look at other opportunities, look at um, HMOs, look at student lets, look at splitting the titles into four flats. And, you know, Ranjan, we talk about that and you've got that in your bag already. So I think for those clients out there looking to make money quickly in this market, I would say, you know, it's not going to happen unless you've got a property where you can turn it into four flats, for example, and then your yields will go from a two to six, seven percent, and then, and then you're great. But obviously you've got to bear in mind, rates are going up. Like the Bank of England base rate, yes, it's 0.1, and it's going to be there for the foreseeable future. However, if we all know if you're borrowing in a limited company, the rates start with a three. Yes. But in your personal name, it's at two. So you've got to be conscious of the interest rates that you're going to be paying in, in return uh, for those investment properties. So. I think, I think we will touch on it. I can't see interest rates moving anything above 0.1, if not going into negative in 21, which I think it's, it's inevitable now. Um, but they're not going to share those rates with you. They're not going to pay you to take out a mortgage tomorrow, right? So yeah. rates are creeping up, and we've seen that during 2020. You know, the cost of borrowing has crept up. 
They are factoring in risk. They are factoring in a correction in the market next year. Um, and I think what people uh, you raise an interesting point about negative interest rates. I mean, um, once this vaccine comes out, they've got to boost the economy somehow. Interest rates are already so low; there isn't any room to cut. So they, so it's likely that they will go negative. Um, there are two ways to pay this, pay for this whole crisis that we've had. One is to tax the shit out of us. The other way is to let it inflate away. And one of the ways of letting it inflate away is to stimulate borrowing and um, asset prices and all the rest of it, which will all help. Um, so when they, when inter if interest rates do go negative, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be paid to take a mortgage. Interest rates will all that we will actually pay will always be in the threes for the foreseeable future, particularly if you're buying, uh, buying in limited companies. Yeah. But the issue is that what negative interest rates do is they make it a penalty for banks to hold cash. So they want to find a good egg and give you the money to do something with it. And the thing for banks is that if they've got a penalty to hold cash, because that's what negative interest rates mean, the bank will get charged by the Bank of England if they are holding on to billions of pounds that they're not lending. Now, are they going to let, who are they going to lend to when they have to lend? Are they going to lend to Doris who's setting up a florist shop in the high street? Or are they going to lend 70% loan to value to a real estate asset? Um, th th there's always a perceived safety in investing in property or yeah. backing property lending, which is why I think it will very much go in our way. Yeah, I think I think with the, with, from a lending perspective, lenders are very open minded and will always be in the residential space. What could be said about the commercial market? I know you're a huge fan of, of, uh, of uh, commercial property. Now, that's a whole different kettle of fish. Now, we do, do commercial mortgages as well, but there's lots more red tape around that and lots more questioning, especially if it's an investment. You know, who's a covenant? What's the length of the lease? How strong are their accounts? You know, how long they've been in business for? So there are huge, huge obstacles in the commercial space. Albeit, I think if you're looking to buy a commercial asset and, and change the purpose of it into residential, I think you, you're, on, you're onto a winner there. But how are you going to buy that commercial asset? And I always ask my clients, what does your resi portfolio look like today? How high, how geared are you? Release equity from your resi portfolio, go and buy that commercial asset in cash. Apply for your planning, um, planning to change the conversion. Come and see me again to build up, take out development finance. So. I think that's the way to play commercial finance if you're looking to acquire assets tomorrow. But um, but listen, the news is always going to be bad, bad news, you know, this, that, 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 that. But from a mortgage perspective, it's I think it's a safe haven. Lenders want to lend, but rates are still very competitive. But it's how it's what you do with that property. And we always say is the profit you make on property is usually on day one. <laughs> and you've got to find that right asset to say, does it wash its own face? Does it have an opportunity tomorrow to repurpose, to convert, to add a floor, to go into the loft? Because in residential, the best way of making money is adding uh, room space. Yeah, The more bedrooms, usually the more value. So I always tell my clients, look for opportunities, but don't look for a quick buck. That's the problem with the, um, the Instagram generation. They want to make a quick buck and then, and then fly on a private jet somewhere. <laughs> Well, we won't go into uh, into that. Okay, um, a couple of people are asking for the names of you guys. Well, uh, our mortgage broker is uh, Akil Mayer. We'll put contact details in the comments. Um, uh, you've been described as the guy with the marble fireplace. That's Matt Sedell. <laughs> we'll put his contact details. On next week's show, we'll make sure we caption people as well. We'll, uh, we'll, 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 we'll do all of that too. Um, uh, brilliant. Let's see. Where Brandon. Yeah, I, want to, I wanted to add one comment about the stamp duty holiday and that's effect on prices. But I also want to close with where are the opportunities because we can thrash that as well. But it's worth noting that the stamp duty holiday is meant to end um, at the end of March. You can it's expect a bit of a... Well, it's meant to, right? And the last time we saw a changing stamp duty that really affected the market was in March, March 30th, for some reason, not March 31st, but it was in 2016. And there was a huge spike in transactions. But um, it's noted that this stamp duty holiday, all it does is release pent up demand and the effects are already beginning to slow a little bit. So it's shoring up prices. So you can expect a bit of a spike in, in March. Um, and if they extend it, then great. And if they revise stamp duty altogether, then great. You know, the goalposts will move and we'll all have something to talk about. But in the meantime, like what, where, you know, where do you buy and what do you buy? Um, and, and in my view, I think you want to avoid volatility and you want to look for 
a, a, a source of value. Um, we had a call yesterday uh, with a couple of my members and one of them was looking at some deals and I said, look, your circumstances are wrong here. You're going to be bidding against the whole world. And I shared my screen with him and we went online and I found a couple of um, uh, commercial properties with offices above and they're really affordable areas. This chap was based between Nottingham and Leicester. I said, look, you can buy that for 220 grand, convert that to resi, convert the uppers to resi. Um, and, and those have got to be pretty good. That's got to be a pretty good source of of development opportunities. I know you're a huge advocate of these of this strategy. Um, where do you see the opportunities over the next 12 to 24 months? Wow, I see the opportunities. Um, uh, I see a huge opportunity in just following uh, government policy and what they're making it easier for us to do. And they're making it easier for us to um, repurpose commercial buildings uh, to alternative uses through permitted development. Um, and it's the path of least resistance. And the great thing is that um, we're seeing, uh, I, I mean, I believe we've seen green shoots over the last couple of days with the vaccine and all the rest of it. Now, what always happens is the commercial market space or property space takes longer to turn around or recover than the residential market space. So you always have this lag. So you have this unique opportunity to, to buy up commercial property uh, repurpose them to residential property and put them on a different path. Different, they're on a different track to recovery. And what this whole crisis has done is only um, accelerated what was happening anyway with certain zombie commercial businesses uh, uh, anyway. Um, so th that piece of those real estate are going to be primed for repurposing. And as Akil pointed out, um, they're not easy to finance. And if you've got residential portfolio and you can raise money through other means and finance them that way, you're in pole position to take advantage of that stuff. And it's half price as well, interest rates compared to commercial rates, right? Sorry? If residential rates start with a two or three, whereas commercial- oh, Absolutely. Six. Absolutely. Um, it's, it, it's the first place to go. And the thing is, too many people focus on this thing where, I mean, there was a PwC survey um, on the last quarter saying that nine and a half thousand shops closed across the UK um, during this um, summer quarter. Uh, but they also meant, and that was picked up by the newspapers and press, but what the report also said is that close to four and a half thousand shops opened in that same period. Um, so the, the thing is to look at who is opening, um, what their requirement is and try to fill it. Yeah. Because um, as soon as you've filled a commercial space, you add value to it. I mean, the easiest way to add value to it is to get a tenant in. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Um, and when they're in, it's done. Job done. And the thing now is that you add significant value because what we see in the commercial auctions now is that if you've repurposed a commercial building, you've secured a tenant to come in and take that property. And then you, if you, and, and you've got a brand new 10 year lease on that property you can sell that straight in a commercial auction. And people seem to be paying under, uh, people are buying those at under 5% yield. Because that's, where else do you go for that security of cash flow? You're not gonna get that from the bank. Yeah, um, and what are you picking them up at the auction these days, Ranjan? What's the cap rate? The, the, the rate at which a decent covenant, a, a property let to a decent covenant um, on a 10 year plus lease. I mean, the great bellwether, for example, is Domino Pizzas. If you find a Domino Pizza, a, a, a unit rented to Domino Pizzas, they're typically 20 year plus leases. They've done very well through lockdown. They're paying their rent, their company that are paying their rent. And if it's in a good area, you'll see those trade on a yield of, of 4%. Close to the banks. Sorry? <laughs> Close yeah. to the bank. Yeah. Talking about dominoes, one of my clients just picked up four different Herbies. So he found four different commercial assets. There were old post office that are dilapidated now. He went in there, went to his went to his Pepe's um, chicken chop franchise, and he picked up all four. And Pepe's actually financed all of them for him. He put a bit of, put, put a personal guarantee on it in the background, and now he's looking to develop the uppers now and buy the and split the titles and put the residential above. So he's a, it's a win win. Yes. Uh, there's some questions on your uh, YouTube channel. Go on then. Which, one, which ones took your eye? Well, just just, out there. So, so fast. 
Yeah, we see some we see some regular questions around, you know, can I buy a buy to let if I'm not a homeowner? So you're a first time buyer and you want to buy your first buy to let. In short, yes, you can. You know, but as long as you are going to buy it as a buy to let investment property and you haven't got an idea to live in it tomorrow. So lender is going to see what type of income have you got? How far is this property, your investment property from where you live and where you work? So if you live in London and you want to buy one in Liverpool, yes, it's going to be a, a buy to let all day long. Some lenders are not, not too fussed around your income. However, they want to ensure that you can cover voids, maintenance. How are you going to manage it if you haven't got the experience? So first time buyer, first time landlord, definitely wide open. Many, many lenders there. Buy to let loan to values, 85%, yes, 80%, yes. But if you want good rates, you need to be at 75% loan to value. Um, other questions I've seen on your on your chat is, should I buy in a limited company? Should I buy in the personal name? Now, this, this com these conversations come up every day of the week. And and uh, we're not tax advisors. Depends where you are on the tax banding. Depends on what your property portfolio looks like today. And we, we, you know the two marks that you, you, you all speak to, Mark Smith and um, the other mark from Property 118. Limited company. You stopped. Mark Alexander. <laughs> Mark Alexander, that was it. Yeah, Mark and Coffee were on it. I know Mark Smith pretty well, but yeah, Mark Alexander, yes. So, um, sorry, Mark, if you're watching. Um, but no, listen, limited company is always a good space to invest in because you've got the tax benefit, right? But it's not fit for everyone. Um, but do speak to a relevant property tax advisor if you're looking to go down that limited company space. Your own, your first buy to let because. You've also got accountancy fees, you've got management costs, and you've got higher borrowing costs as well in a limited company. Um, what are the questions that we've seen in your chat? I mean, I think um, for, for most people, I mean, if you are anywhere, if you are a 40% taxpayer, then it's, it's, yeah. it's a bit of a no brainer to buy property in a company. But if, you're, if your aim is to do this as a business um, and you, you as an income replacement, or to go beyond three or four, that's your aim, um, then you should start out as you mean to go on. Uh, yeah, because yeah, so of the cost of incorporating tomorrow, if you start with four in your personal name, and then you, oh, I should have been, I should have bought them in my limited company, there's a cost, and there's a timely exercise in incorporating the portfolio like we all know of. Um, so yeah, no, do your homework, I say to my clients, speak to the, the property tax accountant, get the relevant advice, Opening a limited company can be done in a matter of seconds, but take up the advice on day one, speak to the professionals, because the last thing you'll do is get it wrong on day one. If you'll just get yourself it all worked up. So Matt, as we, um, uh, we've only got a few minutes left. Now, uh, 2021, now do remember Matt, there's hardly anyone watching. It's more or less just us, us three, yeah. So you can be candid and just be open because no one's watching this. We're just a random YouTube channel. Um, so what's your strategy for 2021? What are you going to be doing? Where, where are you going to be putting your energies and focus? Um, it's just the three of us. It's not going to go anywhere else. So don't worry about it. Just, you know. You've, you've your, really set me up there, strategy. Ranjan, because <laughs> I, am, I am naturally very candid and I, I generally am quite open and honest and sometimes a bit too open and honest. And I'll, I'll make the occasional bad joke. Um, but I, I don't want to give away all my secrets, but I, I do want to, I do want to buy, I, I love the look of the distressed commercial real estate. The government wants us to repurpose these buildings. Uh, that's why they're encouraging us to develop them. The trend is your friend. Um, I, I, I've got a lot of investors in my network and a lot of them are busy running their businesses or they don't have the knowledge or the contacts that I have. So I'd love to develop property for other people who just want a check once a quarter. If you get five or six percent on your money once a quarter and you get the the lion's share of the capital appreciation why wouldn't you let someone else do that work for you uh, there's there's a there's a chance that i'll be moving to dubai this winter and coming to london one weekend a month and spending three weekends a month in dubai with my family in which case i'll definitely be looking to work with other investors who just want a check once a quarter um why are you going to do to that dubai? is that why or am yeah. i yeah why um well, my wife's not from London and she's lived here for 16 years and she fancies a change. Uh, the weather's better. Uh, there's there's a lot of business to be picked up there for, for myself and for my wife, who, who's, who's got a successful career. Um, the time zone difference is only four hours. Um, and the, the kids are young. We could do it for a few years. We love living in Wimbledon. Wimbledon's great. Um, but 
I quite fancy the idea of being in London one weekend a month, being in Dubai three weekends a month, and spending July and August uh, in France. We've got a place in the Alps that we can use. I um, definitely don't want to be in Dubai in July and August. I'm, I'll spontaneously combust. I'm, I'm English. <laughs> but, um, but I, 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 you know, my strategy is to be working with investors who just want to check once a quarter and no management issues. And the investors and I will own the Propco. The investor can have nearly all the shares in the Propco. I'd like a piece of it, but not all of it. And then an operating company that operates uh, the property. So whether that's serviced accommodation or developing it or what have you, uh, but just make it really simple for the investor and, and preferably give them a, a, a preferential return that's fixed. And getting, getting those deals set up properly and making it simple for the investor and making it comfortable for them, I think is how, um, I think it's the best way for developers to build large portfolios. Okay. And what sort of um, asset are you going to go for? Well, I mean, my, my three criteria for any deal is the right vendor, the right property uh, and the right circumstances. So, you know, I don't want to be outbidding everybody in sealed bids. Uh, I, I, I want as little competition as possible. I want a property that I can pr improve and extend or change the use or all of the above. Uh, and I want a vendor who's not just a tire kicker. They do want, they do want, uh, the money more than they want the, the building. Um, but it needs to be high yield for the investor to get their return and for me to get my income above that. Um, and I don't need huge income from the portfolio, but I'd like it to obviously cash flow really nicely. I'm, I'm more interested in capital appreciation because in my experience, that's where the bigger returns have come from. Uh, as I said, those flats that I bought in 2009 gave me the capital gains that I needed to put a deposit down on this place, which has been a great home for us for nearly eight years. Um, and, and, and also the capital appreciation is the greatest return on energy, as you call it, or the return on work. Mm -hmm. you, know, you turn around and suddenly the property's gone up by a hundred grand. You know, mm -hmm. oh, great. I'd like to pull that out and buy more. Okay. No, brilliant. I mean, I agree with you that the um, the time to sow the seeds for capital appreciation over the next decade uh, will be pretty much twenty from <laughs> all of twenty twenty one. Absolute golden time because it's. It's not just capital appreciation, it is also um, um, wealth protection, should we say, because I don't think people fully appreciate the extent of this money printing and what impact it's going to have on the real value of the cash that you have. And the way to kind of protect that is to stick it in something finite, stick it in something they can't print. They can print a £10 note, but they can't print that marble fireplace behind you, Matt, <laughs> in Wimbledon. <laughs> that's finite, that's there. <laughs> and that's where, that's where the, 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 the um, and that's where all this money will go in inflating those sort of finite assets. Um, and the way to get, and we've got this unique opportunity to get in on the ground floor of that big um, uh, price-wise upswing because there's going to be this lull caused by this unemployment issue, which may be around for the entire 2021, who knows. But until that turns the corner, it's going to be a fantastic opportunity. For the right investor, because some investors are still a bit, you know, a bit weary of unemployment and they think that unemployment means that house prices are going to crash, but they don't factor in the fact that interest rates are at 0.1%. You know, I did have lunch with an investor last week. He's sitting on a huge amount of cash and he needs to put it into bricks and mortar. He needs to diversify it. He needs to spread it around a bit and get invested because he's just sitting on way too much cash. Um, and if he's buying and holding on a long term basis and they're good income producing assets, then he, he's, he's happy to hoover up, you know, any good, any good assets that he can find right now. I mean, that's Whereas, a very good point. We touched on negative interest rates. Negative interest rates is also going to be a problem for people with cash. Um, if someone has got, uh, say, 50 grand, um, next year, if negative interest rates come on board, you will be charged to have that money in the bank. So those sort of folks will be looking for homes for it, whether they're looking at directly investing in property or investing in, 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 a, um, in an accomplished investor. So the most important thing, if you're out there wondering where to get money, um, is to find the deal. Because if you can find the deal, there shouldn't be any problem with finding investors um, because no one likes this situation of low interest rates. Yeah, but well, the, the point about negative interest rates is that these private equity funds are sitting on huge amounts of cash, mm -hmm. like enormous amounts of cash, and it needs to be put out into the economy to, to, to fund growth. Uh, it's not really meant to attack you know, your regular retail savers. 
but the portfolio I started in Reading um, was with a guy who worked for a very large asset manager. And if anyone who's ever tried to look me up on Companies House will find his name and right click it and find all the other companies he was a director of. But he was investing cash because he had all his bonuses in the bank. And he was worried that in 2010, 11, the government were going to let inflation erode their debt. And he just wanted to go out and buy houses. And he, he, he owned half the portfolio with me in Reading. He bought a house for his sister in California. He bought a house for his dad in, in Limington. He bought a house for his, you know, just buy houses because rents and house prices move upwards with inflation and cash just gets depleted. So, you know, cash is king, but not when hyperinflation kicks in because the government's got two trillion pounds worth of debt, which is what we're looking at at the moment. This, it's horrendous. I don't think people have <laughs> fully uh, cottoned on to that. Um, and finally, Akil, um, the the mortgage market. I mean, um, should we be remortgaging now or wait till next year to remortgage and raise capital? Uh, is this as good as it gets or will it get, will products get more appealing next year? Um, I say we can't we can't forecast the future. You know we can't we can't predict the bottom of the market. It's the same with with interest rates. We can't predict anything. But what we anticipate is negative interest rates. We're going to expect high unemployment. We're going to expect a, a small correction in the residential market, but it's going to be a huge uplift. And everyone said it. This 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 is 2021 is going to be like the 2011, and then it just kicked off and prices just inflated incredibly. So I think we've got a great decade of opportunity here, one, a decade of opportunity here. I think you've got to find the right asset first and then you remortgage. Remortgaging is very easy. Capital raising is fairly easy, as long as you use the right broker. Another plug there for me. But if you, if you, I would say find the, find the asset that you want to buy. Understand what the red roll looks like. Understand if there's going to be an opportunity of repurposing. If you can get both of those, picks that amazing then come and see me refinance capital raise um at a right level if you want the sweet spot interest rate stay at the 60 percent loan to values but a lot of our guys are seasoned investors they want to gear up at the higher end at 75 percent loan to values and and you can do that quite easily if you borrow in a limited company you can borrow more money because the calculations are a lot more um a lot more less it's less stricter if you like in, in a five-year fix for example in a limited company space so Remortgaging is not a problem. I think interest rates are going to stay rock bottom. Interest rates over the last 12 months have gone up from a, a lending perspective. So just be mindful of that. But look for those assets. Look at what you're going to do with those properties and then come and see me. I need 100 grand for my portfolio. What's the best way of doing it? But there's no point taking out 100 grand and then sitting on it because the longer you sit on it, it's, you're going to have deflation at the end of the day. My, king, cash is king, but cash in this market is not king whatsoever. So gear up. Use the money inside for really find the right properties because I think it, it's a no-brainer. I think the next we've got nine years now. I think it's a great opportunity to buy a property. I think this is going to be the it's a rolls of reverse now. This is now going to be our 2011, and we're going to see it in 2021. So um, yeah, hopefully that was understood. <laughs> what's your what's your take, Ranjan? What are you doing in 21? 21. Well, um, more well more, more of what I've just really uh, talked about. I mean, I just see this. Um, uh, it, it, it's to, it will be quite frankly to buy all the stuff that I'm looking at are commercial buildings that we can repurpose, um, and it's it's what I've been saying uh, all along really because the, the the some of the rates that you're getting per square foot in terms of purchase price, you look at the differential between the price per square foot of commercial property and the price per square foot of what you can repurpose it to. There's a massive uplift, and that's in the here and now. So my strategy is very much um, purchase, repurpose, re get cash flow positive on it, refinance and go again. Um, that's exactly what I did in 2009. And it's the same thing again now. Um, as long as you can um, buy, repurpose, cash flow and refinance and get pretty much most of your money out, you're good to go on the next one. And then a decade will sort out all the capital appreciation, provided you've, you've bought into the right area. I don't think now is the time for areas um, in the country where, you know, there's some areas in the country where unemployment is, has always been high. Um, the, the, the population is decreasing. Blackpool, population is decreasing in Blackpool. It, it has been since 
before COVID, you know, the, the, the places to go for are the areas which were strong before COVID, um, because they're the likely ones to pick up where there's been infrastructure spend and all of this sort of stuff. They're the ones that are likely to pick up where, where population is good where, and growing and where employment was very, very strong pre-COVID. They'll pick up. So what's your take on people? Because I we, we help clients all over the country, right? So they're, they're buying properties all over the country. They might live in London, but they might be buying in Blackpool, for example, or Liverpool, or whatever. So we've got one client at the moment that's buying a five and a half million pound uh, apartment in Battersea. Now, he thinks he's getting it at a steal. He thinks it's seven and a half all day, but he's buying it for five and a half million. So would you, in my mind, you know, it's great. He's obviously done his maths. He thinks he's getting a great deal. What's your take on prime end? Um, the prime end is strange because the prime end is um, it doesn't cash flow. Mm. So they tend to be um, very, very wealthy people looking for a store of value. And that's basically it. It's, a, it's like a safety deposit box. It's a store of value. Um, mm. the, problem, the problem is, is it's very difficult to cash flow in the immediate term. You may, and the, the other thing is the high end, the super prime, is very is very flaky. It can easily go up by a five million pound property. Can easily go up a million and a half quid, but it can easily come down by a million and a half. Mm. You know, whereas the zone two, zone three, London areas, they're much more sort of regular areas where people um, uh, um, where, where, where people who actually work in London, live in London, actually stay and reside as opposed to the international market in the prime zones and all of that. Um, so those represent far better value. Now, what I've, you're right in saying that the, these sort of areas, you know, they pick up well and they'll do well from the capital appreciation trend, but it's very, very hard um, to do buy to let in London, simply because of the thing, the entry level is flats. And those have high service charges, which massively affect your net yield and profitability. The way I've seen it work and the way I've made it work is the mixed use stuff. Uh, the minute you get shop and uppers, you're buying it at a less price per square foot. You, you, you can create two or three flats within that freehold building. You're in control of all the service charge and maintenance of the, of the whole building. And your blended yield becomes quite respectable comparable with places outside of London on that sort of building. Um, but those sort of buildings, zones two, three, four, um, work very, very well. Yeah. Um, and, and they will grow because, you know, there's a finite number of locations which are within 30 minutes commuting distance of London. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I guess, I guess everyone's got their own views. Everyone's got their own philosophies, their forecasting, you know, people think, we're going to see a massive collapse. Some think some are very optimistic. They're going to see they can't see it going any lower. So it's in, it's interesting, and I, and I love jumping on these sorts of calls just to get an understanding of what the mindset looks like, where the opportunities lie, and, and, and what they're um, what they're going to be doing in their own portfolios. Matt, anything for you from your end? Get as much money as you can, buy as much property as you can. That was the best advice I got from a guy with a two billion pound portfolio. I said, I want to know all the secrets. What are the secrets? You just yeah. get as much money as you can, buy as much property as you can. I was like, is that it? You're like, yeah. <laughs> it's simple. I think I think that's just human. We overcomplicate things, you know. I, you know, I, tell, I always say to my clients, tell me where you want to be, where are you now, and let me feel, let me help plug those gaps for you. I think as humans, I think it's just natural genetics. We we like to overcomplicate things, and I always say keep things simple. Yeah. But it is what it is. So we got to wrap up. Uh, can I get you another coffee, guys? I mean, I'm going to get a skinny soy latte. What are you guys having? <laughs> I'll have a, I'll have another grandy latte. I'm a mini mega milky chocolate mocha, please, Rancho. You can have one of those. And what, a herbal tea for you, Akil? Or? Yeah, I'll maybe take a uh, croissant with it, if it's okay. You've got the budget for it. You still uh, have the croissants. I, <laughs> and for I don't you know how you keep it off me. At <laughs> home, go and make yourself another cup of coffee too. And join us next week at 10 for another Property Coffee Morning and Topical Chat on property related topics thanks for joining us guys if you've done a nice little paper shuffle at the end it's brilliant <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. good to see you buddy Bye -bye. take care guys